Thanks everybody for joining us today for today's Arthur Island Institute seminar. It's our October seminar and we've got two presenters from ARI today, which is awesome. Um, your host today, I'm Fern Hames, I'm the director at ARI and I'm delighted to see you all joining us online for this seminar, which um, of course will be available afterwards as a, um, as a recording as well. While we've been waiting to get started, we've just been looking at some of the photos in the background and talking about flowers and I've been you know, thinking about country and I would like to acknowledge that we're meeting today on Wurundjeri country. I pay my respects to traditional owners and elders past and present, to emerging leaders, to all First Nations people that might be with us today and of course to country and traditional elders right across uh, traditional owners and elders right across where people are joining us from today as well. I know that you'll be distributed certainly across the state and um, perhaps beyond there as well. So my acknowledgements and uh, welcome to everybody who's joining in today. We do have two speakers. We've got Joz and Cindy. Um, Joz is going to speak first and she's going to talk with us, to us about the lovely alliteratively named Nutrient Network. It's a fabulous name. <laughs> it's um, a wonderfully long-term study. Anything that's long-term, we just go, oh, yes, please, can we have more of those? And this one's um, a globally distributed plant ecology experiment. Pretty exciting. It's um, hugely recognised and valued by the people who know about it. So I'm really excited and grateful for Jaws being able to share it with us today. And I'll introduce what Cindy's going to talk about after we've heard from Jos. So, Jos, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks very uh, much, Fern. So, I'd um, also like to start by acknowledging the Jar Jar Wurrung and the Wurundjeri people on whose land I live and work, and note that was no treaty has ever been signed or country was ceded. And so I'd like to pay my respect to elders past and present. And I'd also like to pay my respect to the elders um, of the many traditional custodians of the Bogong High Plains and surrounding areas, which is where my field site is, which is where this photo is. Um, that includes the Dudaroa people, the Gunai Kurnai, the Terengarang, the Waiwuru and the Yatmathang peoples. Uh, I'd also like to extend my acknowledgement and respect to the elders of the traditional custodians of the land from wherever you're joining us, as well as any traditional custodians or First Nations people that are joining us today. Uh, so, as Fern said, my name's Jocelyn Moore. I'm a senior scientist at ARI, uh, but I'm also a member of the Nutrient Network Global Glass Band Experiment. So, my Nutrient Network site is at Falls Creek Resort on the Bogong High Plains in Victoria. So the Nutrient Network is a grassroots collaboration in which each site around the globe implements exactly the same plant ecology experiment, and then we pull the data to create a global data set. So today I'm going to tell the story of NutNet, why it was established, how it works, and some of the things we've learned about plant ecology and about undertaking cooperative science. So this is a photo of the grassland on the Bogong High Plains in Victoria, where my site is. And what's really noticeable is that even in this very small space, it's very diverse. There are more than 30 different species, at least in this one small area. So how can so many species coexist? It isn't just that they have different ways of life. There are many grasses here that have had a very similar life form. Why doesn't one grass outcompete the rest? And even with so many species, there are still spaces here that have got bare ground. So what's regulating plant growth? Not all the space is taken up. Is it top down? Is it controlled by grazing and herbivory? Or is it bottom up? Is it controlled by available resources? Things like nutrients, water, light. Also, what regulates ecosystem function in these systems? How, how is productivity, decomposition, nutrient cycling regulated in these plant communities? And how is this influenced by the environment and plant diversity and the composition of the um, vegetation? So these are the fundamental questions that plant community ecology seeks to address, trying to understand what regulates diversity, productivity, ecosystem function in plant communities. As well as that, at the moment, we're changing the earth in many ways. In addition to climate change, we've also fundamentally changed nutrient cycles in the last 200 years with the advent of 
large scale application of fertilizers. There's now twice as much available nitrogen and four times as much available phosphorus in the global nutrient cycle. And that continues to increase. And this just isn't where it's being fertilized on the land. It's spread like atmospherically all around the globe now. And so this is really important because these are two of the limiting nutrients for plant growth. And so this global fertilization will likely increase primary production, but it will also change the composition of the vegetation, shifting towards species in the short term and even vegetation types in the longer term that do best when nutrients are high. So this is really likely to result in decreases in diversity, which might result in more variability in productivity and a less stable ecosystem functions into the future. But it's also really important for biodiversity when we think that many of our really diverse vegetation types, our really special places, are actually low in nutrients, low productivity grasslands, semi-arid heathlands. Think Southwest WA and the Finbos, chalk grasslands in the UK even. These special places are often, um, we think, maintained by low productivity and low nutrients. So another thing that's changing is that many wild herbivores are declining in their home ranges while they're spreading um, to new places due to pastoralism and um, animal introductions. So now there's a lot of grazing in regions that are unaccustomed to it, but decreases or changing patterns of grazing and herbivory in, in places where um, herbivores um, were previously common. And so this is really important because consumption of biomass is another important limit to plant growth and strongly influences both productivity and also the composition of grasslands. So all of these things are changing at once. What does all this mean for plant communities? We're expecting change, of course, but with so many changes, it's a challenge to understand which processes are going to dominate or how they're going to interact with each other. So all of these questions were what um, motivated a team of early career researchers in the US to address, um, to sort of answer these questions. They were trying to synthesize existing knowledge on the effects of nutrient availability on primary production. I won't talk about that specific study here, but it was like a companion paper. And also on this question about top-down, bottom-up um, sort of regulation. So how nutrients and herbivory regulated primary production and how they interacted. So they did a meta-analysis to synthesize studies across terrestrial um, ecosystems, like plant ecosystems, and they also did freshwater and marine systems, but I'm just going to focus on the plant results here. And so what they found was that producer community bio biomass increased with fertilization, um, as they expected, but the herbivore effects were inconsistent. Um, there was um, in the terrestrial system and there was no real evidence of interactions between fertilizing and excluding herbivory, um, even though this was predicted to be the case by theory and had been observed in different individual experiments. But it was very variable between studies and it was quite hard to compare because each study slight, did, took a slightly different approach to doing the experiment. And so they also found that there were very few long term studies. So this group was feeling a bit frustrated because it was quite hard to sort of address this question in a general way. Every, you know, there were studies that had answered that question for just one place at one sort of snapshot of time, but there was not really global consistency. It's hard to do an experiment that's everywhere um, across the globe. But it's also really hard to do a long term experiment because it's hard to get funding for a research question that's more to that's more than three to five years, which is like the length of sort of a large grant or a PhD study. And so this means that long-term experiments are really rare and it makes it really difficult to observe the long-term response of plant populations and communities to changes in nutrient levels or herbivory, because most plants live longer than three to five years. So they had this idea that rather than do try and do one big experiment, they propose to do many widely distributed and coordinated small experiments. And this is the underlying idea of the nutrient network. So they advertise their idea through the Ecological Society of America in the US, a new spread around the world. I heard about it at the Ecological Society of Australia annual meeting. And the first sites were established in 2008. 
So two of this initial group were Elizabeth Borer and Eric Seabloom, who have become really central sort of um, for the NutNet organisation. They've re really championed the project, they've attracted funding for data curation, they've hosted annual meetings, and they've led many of the analyses. Most of the initial sites were in the US, but there were four sites in Australia and a few sites in Europe. There were less than 50 sites to start with, somewhere between sort of 30 and 45, depending on various combinations of who did what parts of the experiment. But there's now more than 130 sites around the world, and so there's, mu and there's much better global coverage. So what is the Nutrient Network? So the idea is that everyone carries out an identical experiment at their site, which is funded by the local site leader. The aim of the experiment is to understand the role of nutrient availability and herbivory on the structure and function of grasslands. The experimental protocol is simple and has a low replication at each site so that it can be undertaken with a minimal of effort and it doesn't require dedicated large grant funding. So it just takes a couple of weeks of, year to do, of the year to do, hopefully um, just with volunteers. So low cost, that's the key. As well as the core experiment, numerous add-ons have been proposed and undertaken over the years, including soil sampling to characterise the microbiome and measuring of plant traits. So there are just two work rules, work well with everyone else and carefully follow the core sampling protocol. So the experimental design is as follows. So each replicate is made up of 10 5 by 5 metre plots, with each plot receiving one of 10 treatments. Together, these 10 treatments make up two overlapping experiments. The first experiment is to, to test the degree to which grasslands are limited by um, each nutrient or combination of nutrients and consists of applying nitrogen, phosphorus or potassium, potassium is indicated by the K, in all eight possible combinations. So these are the three main um, nutrients for plants, uh, including a no treatment, no nutrient control treatment. So this, uh, the amount of um, nutrients that is applied is sufficient to release the grassland from that nutrient as a resource constraint. So if the nutrient is limiting, then biomass should increase when it's implied. If the nutrient isn't limiting, then biomass shouldn't change. The other treatment is to exclude herbivory by building a fence. So these are small fences. The idea is that they keep the herbivores out of the inside. So in this case, these are large herbivores that can be excluded by chicken wire low down and just wires at the top. So in Australia, this excludes deer, kangaroos, rabbits, hares, uh, doesn't probably exclude mice. Uh, in the US, it definitely doesn't exclude bofers. So this means that if herbivory is limiting in, these, in a grassland, we expect biomass to increase within the fenced plot. But if it is not limiting, then we'd expect it not to change. But two plots are fenced in each replicate. One plot is just fenced and the other plot is fenced and fully fertilised. And so this means that along with two unfenced plots, we have a set of four treatments that addresses the potential interaction between fertilising and herbivory. So this design is replicated at least three times in each site. So there are 30 plots monitored at each site, three plots of each treatment, and the total footprint is about 150 square metres. So treatments are applied annually at the beginning of the growing season and measurements are taken once per year at peak growth. So what do we measure? So we measure, um, the first thing that we measure is uh, in a one metre uh, fixed permanent quadrat, we measure species cover um, individually. So we measure composition and um, as well as cover, so relative abundance. We also measure biomass, so we um, above ground biomass. So we clip the above ground biomass and sort it into functional group, graminoids, forbs and shrubs. And we also split it between natives and exotics. We also measure light um, at ground level, where we measure the difference actually between light above and below the canopy. And this is an indication of the amount of above ground competition that's occurring for light. We also take soil samples um, intermittently and we take photos of quadrats each year as well. 
There are also lots of different add-ons that we've done over the years. We've put out resin exchange bags. We've looked at decomposition rates using oat um, leaf litter bags and also tea bags. We uh, tried to characterise the soil micro biome. We've tried to characterise the leaf microbiome. We've looked at plant traits. We've measured um, species, nested species area plots to try and understand how scale might be um, affecting patterns of diversity, etc. So lots of different things. So once we've done this um, data gathering each year, data is submitted annually to the main database. All members have access to the data. Papers can be proposed by anyone. Um, the sort of the main model is opt-in authorship. So it's offered to all that contribute data and make a second contribution. So that contribution might be uh, comments on the paper, um, helping to do the analysis, code checking, etc. Elizabeth and Eric also host one week uh, annual uh, meetings uh, to stimulate all ideas and to help forge collaborations. So these are normally in this in sort of August. So what have we learned about ecology from this? And the short answer is lots. So the Nutrient Network has 140 publications listed on Google Scholar at the moment and more than 12,000 um, citations. The first big results papers were published in 2011, but there's been like 100 papers since 2000, from 2017. And so the number of publications is really increasing very fast. So a lot of these um, papers are really high profile too. I can think of at least 20 papers that have been published in the nature or science groups of journals. Um, with so much to cover, I can really not scratch the surface, but I thought I'd just focus on one particular aspect here, which is the response of plant diversity to nutrient addition and herbivory. green. So you may recall from what I said earlier that nutrient availability and herbivory can both limit plant growth. And so we might expect changes in biomass if those things change. And then changes in biomass might have um, flow on effects for plant diversity. And so this is the question I'm going to discuss here. How do changes in nutrients and herbivory affect plant diversity? So we hypothesize that if nutrients are limiting, we expect fertilization to reduce plant diversity via increased biomass shifting competition from below ground nutrients to above ground competition for light. Similarly, herbivores reduce above ground biomass and hence reduce above ground competition. So if herbivory is limiting and it's excluded by the fence, then we expect that diversity would decrease within the fence plot as well because there'll be more biomass, less light, So in this 2014 study that was led by Elizabeth Bora, we were able to show that the response of biodiversity to fertilisation was as expected um, overall, in that diversity, in this case measured as species richness, decreased when fertiliser, which is NPK here, is applied. And you can see that there was, um, this is the, this was the mean change and the error bars are confidence intervals. And so the confidence intervals don't overlap with zero. So it was uh, a significantly different effect. And you can see it's quite large. Um, but with herbivore exclusion, there wasn't a significant effect, as you can see by the fact that these um, bars are overlapping. And the same with the um, interaction. So there was a lot more variation. You can see there was a lot of variation in all cases, but the variation for the um, effect of um, fencing or the interaction was sometimes negative, but also sometimes positive. So a lot more variable. And this really reflected the variation in um, the sort of site to site variation in how each grassland responded to herbivory. And you know, there's sort of lots of things that might affect this. So variation in the baseline actual amount of herbivory that was going on at the site. So some sites have got more herbivores um, present than others. Um, variation in the baseline productivity of the grassland. So some um, grasslands might actually not be being limited by herbivory, uh, as we've mentioned. And also the evolutionary history of grazing at each grassland, which I'll come back to in a minute. However, what we were able to show was that even though there was a lot of variation in response to this fencing, 
Um, the mechanism that we'd hypothesised did seem to be supported by our data in that there was a correlation between um, the amount of light that was available and the um, and the and the species richness. So the effect of so when fences reduced light, they also reduced diversity. Or if fences did not reduce light or resulted in increased light, then it also resulted in increased diversity. So there was this correlation. So it seemed like the light um, that light mechanism was supported. But so this not being able to really disentangle this um, th these effects, th these fencing effects, and it just being very variable, um, you know, is something that has been a bit of a, um, we've made quite a lot of effort to try and deal with this. And this study, which was led by Jodie Price and Judith Siddhartha, um, tried to really address this by thinking about this idea about evolutionary history. So in this study, more recent study, I think it just came out last, yeah, yeah. Um, we classified the grasslands into those that had long and short evolutionary histories of ungulate grazing. So ungulates are um, hard hoofed um, grazers, so deer, horses, sheep, cattle, um, most large herbivores. Um, this was a this was actually a massive task, but it really helped to disentangle these effects. So what we'd expected was that. Um, herbivory is more likely to be limiting in grasslands if they've co-evolved with ungulate herbivores. And so we expected a di diversity to decrease in these grasslands um, where if herbivores were excluded, so within fenced areas. Conversely, we expected those with short evolutionary histories to be less likely to be adapted to um, this, this sort of herbivory. And so it'd be less likely that this um, process would be one that maintained diversity. And so we don't expect a consistent decrease in these grasslands when grazing is excluded. And so um, that's pretty much what we found, uh, which was uh, pretty exciting. Um, so excluding herbivory resulted in reduced diversity in grasslands with a long evolutionary history um, of ungulate grazing, but not for grasslands with a short um, evolutionary history. And this suggests that grazing is really likely to be an important process for maintaining plant diversity in grasslands with long histories of ungulate herbivory, but not so much for those with short histories. And I mean, this is what we see in Australia that doesn't have a um, long history of ungulate grazing. Uh, quite often, grazing has resulted in reductions of diversity in grasslands. Um, and so just, you know, as we've said, this is a long term experiment. So I just wanted to quickly touch on uh, one um, result that we've had that shows um, the sort of value of the long term experiment. And so we're now starting to see how these treatments influence plant communities over the long term. And so this recent paper looked at the effect of fertilising, um, in this case, all all fertiliser together, so N, P and K, on diversity and showed that many sites are still decreasing in their diversity um, and that a new steady state has not reached. So these systems are still changing after more than a decade. So this is the years of fertilisation. The maximum year was 11, and this is the effect of fertilisation. So the, line, the black line is the mean overall, and then the coloured lines are all the different sites. So you can see that just about all of them are still decreasing um, in their diversity. So this really emphasises how important it is um, to be undertaking these long-term studies. We've been monitoring these grasslands here for 11 years and actually for longer, but knowing what happens after three or five years isn't enough to tell us what's going to happen next. So as well as learning loads about ecology, um, this project has also taught us loads about working together and what can be achieved. In my view, really the key to this has been, this experiment is small enough and simple enough that you don't need dedicated funding. Um, with, you can just use pretty limited site funding and this is absolutely crucial for being able to run a long-term experiment. And I think it's the long-term nature of this experiment that's one of the real strengths. It certainly was the motivation for me to join the Nutrient Network was this idea that we could establish 
an experiment that would run for 20 or 30 years. Um, so as I said before, Elizabeth and Eric have emerged as really important champions of the network. And I think they've been re it's been really important to have champions. These, um, they were able to attract funding to curate the data. They've hosted annual workshops, but their energy has been just really crucial, I think, in maintaining the momentum of the network and it's just not sort of getting diffused and sort of slowly doing away over time. Um, we did learn really early on that it is super critical to have data curation support. It's a lot of data and making sure that it's all consistent and accurate, um, accurate actually um, requires quite a lot of work. And it's really important if we're going to, if this data is going to be accessible and fit for analysis. So it's just super important and it's just a non, like it doesn't just do itself. And um, even though everyone was dedicated and doing it themselves, all the data was slightly different. And we had a template. All this data was slightly different from each, um, often from each site. And there did need to be some kind of centralising um, harmonisation going on. It's also really important to have clear processes for publications and and how data is analysed. So there have been very few problems, but there was kind of one or two early um, sort of small issues that led to the development of this really clear process for how to propose papers and um, how to offer authorship. And it's worked really well. And over time, I mean, you know, often these papers have got 70 authors on them. And so uh, quite a lot of um, skills have been developed too, in terms of how to coordinate and manage enormous multi-authored papers. And in fact, I think um, Elizabeth Bora might have just led a paper um, on that very topic. Um, We've also learned that it's not always as easy as you'd think to maintain the same protocol over time. So fertilizer types actually change over time and it can make it quite hard to get exactly the right nutrient. Um, for example, we apply phosphorus as triple superphosphate, but this is kind of declining a lot in popularity in Australia, which is probably a good thing, but it is making sourcing it for the experiment increasingly difficult. Um, NutNet's also inspired other distributed experiments, including plant potnet, which is a, uh, um, in the, a monitoring study examining population dynamics of Plantago lanceolata around the world, and Dragnet, which is an experiment aimed at understanding the role of disturbance in plant communities. But I guess most of all, you know, NutNet shows just the power of cooperative science. Like by working together and rather than competing with each other, we've just achieved things that were completely unattainable on our own. It's um, pretty amazing. And 15 years and counting. So um, thanks a lot. Finally, I'd just like to say thanks to the Nutrient Network and all the awesome ecologists that have made it such an amazing experience and fantastic and successful experiment. I'd especially like to thank the many, many volunteers, students and collaborators that have helped up at the Bogong site um, over the years, with special mentions to John Morgan, who's the site co-leader, uh, two absolute stalwarts of, um, of uh, assistance over the years, Kate Gillihan and Tara Zaman, uh, as well as the fence masters. So building little fences up on the Bogong High Plains is actually quite hard. We've had to build them twice because uh, the conditions are quite um, extreme up there as well. And so I'd like to thank Jen Fern, Rowan Mott and Casey Visited for all their um, help in that quite difficult task. Uh, thanks very much. There is an, um, a website for NutNet if you're interested. It's up in the top left corner there. Also happy if you ever have any questions, get in touch with me. Thanks. Does. Thank you. Um Encouraging all the applause all around the screen. <laughs> um, that is fabulous. What a what a brilliant story of truly collective effort. You know, all those small individual efforts everywhere building to a greater whole, you know, more than the sum of the parts. It's really fabulous. I love the two rules around, you know, play nicely and follow the rules, follow the protocol, nice and simple. And I love that, I don't know if you did this deliberately, but you've, absolutely followed the actual principles of principles of formal collective impact 
you know, which are around having a common vision, having decent comms and, you know, methods, common methods, backbone support, like they're all there. It's just, I guess it's almost intuitive, the things that we know that will make collective effort work really successfully. And this is an awesome example. It's really, and the long term. Thanks, Gwen. Very impressive. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I did have questions like going through, I was thinking about, you know, compounding effects and other things and the diversity across the world. But I'm going to check if there's, I'm having a quick look in the chat. Tess, have we got any questions in the chat or does anyone else like to type in a question now before we go to Cindy? Um, Gabriel's put a, a question in the chat, um, but it, he's then responded saying, I think you've kind of answered it, but um, it might be good for you to kind of talk about it as well, is what do you think of this uh, model for answering other large complex ecological questions? What are the pros and cons? So, I mean, I think it is a good model and, you know, as well as these on ground questions, um, you know, I think these, these kind of, these approaches are being used a lot in big data too, trying to set up sort of standardised data collection protocols to try and um, do that as well. If you think about the big plant traits or the sort of population modelling efforts that are going on globally as well. Um, so I I think there's a lot of promise for this. I guess the only, um, you know, and this, I think the real key is about trying to keep a fairly focused question and making sure that the core activity is pretty small and doable because that's what um you know that that's what you know like simple enough that people can do it in just one or two weeks you know because that's what's really key you know, i think in terms of being able to keep going over the long term um and so i guess there's a limit to how much complexity that you can have for those kinds of things but um yeah yeah awesome Thanks, Jocelyn. I've got another question. Um, could your methods be adapted for ecological surveys as a standard practice set, do you think? Uh, do you mean the, the information that we collect or the, the sort of the idea of um, having a standardised protocol? So certainly the standardised protocol. Um, the information that we collect potentially, I mean, it's pretty classical, like it's pretty classic anyway. These weren't it wasn't a standard um, method. Um, yeah, so yeah, I think so. Like, I think it's a fairly classic uh, methodology. Oh, I know that there are some, there's some people at ARI working on some instructions for ecological survey methods as well. So yeah, yep. yeah. we're all thinking about that kind of thing. Um, I'm just looking at the time. I have some more questions for you, Jocelyn, but maybe we'll move on to Cindy and we'll ask any more questions at the end. Sure. Fern, do you want to do your intro? Sure. And thanks again to Jos. That was really terrific. And uh, as Jos has invited, if you would like to follow up and chat with her, maybe, Jos, you could put your email address in the chat or something while Cindy's yeah, talking. That would be awesome. And maybe the um, that um, site for NutNet, that might be of interest yeah. to people as well. Thank you so much. So let's now turn to Cindy. Um, Cindy, kind of a similar idea, really. This is another idea about bringing together multiple data sources to help us understand something in common. And um, I'm really looking forward to this and I'm already entranced with the image on the first slide. It's just gorgeous. Um, Cindy, over to you. Tell us about multiple data sources informing fire management, getting quite topical as we... Um, head into another season. I know you're talking about planning rather than wildfire, but still fires on our mind. So over to you, thank you. Absolutely, thank you very much, Fern. Um, can you see and hear things correctly at the moment? All good, looks great, thank you. Great, thank you. So um, today I'd like to tell you about some work that I've been doing in collaboration with some of my DHI colleagues, um, including Neville, Josephine, Lawrence and Simon. It's work that's been funded by the Safer Together program within the Victorian government. And we have a really terrific quantitative team at ARI, and I'd like to shout them out too as a group who've offered me some really great advice along the way. And thank Michael Livingston for many of the lovely bird photos that you're going to see throughout my slides. 
Um, as was mentioned earlier, ARI sits on Wurundjeri country. That's where I live and work. But um, this research is stuff that intersects with many First Nations across the place that we call Victoria. So I'd like to um, pay my respects across those lands to elders, laws, customs and creation spirits. So what I want to talk about today is FAME. FAME is um, the acronym for Fire Analysis Module for Ecological Values. This is a tool that we use within DECA for estimating the effects of different fire regimes on environmental values within this state. And the kinds of information that it takes in, in as part of that process is the fire history across the landscape through time. In the diagram you can see there it's an um, exercise with historical fire, but um, this is something that can be done both retrospectively and as a forecast. We need to think about what's the suitable habitat in the landscape for each of the species that we're concerned with. And we also need to have a model for the response to time since fire for each of these species that we're concerned with. Once we've gathered that kind of information, what we can do is we can track the um, relative abundance of species over time, and we can collate that across multiple species um, using a geometric mean abundance as well. We can track the area burned below tolerable fire interval across space and time, and we can also track the area of um, vegetation growth stages over space and time, which are all really in, um, important considerations as we scenario test different potential fire regimes into the future and assess what's um, potentially best for biodiversity or a good trade-off with um, public safety too, for example. Now, I really want to focus on that formal response, one of those inputs that we have for FAME. Um, within FAME, what we do is we think of species response to fire as the species relative abundance, and we think of it in terms of how that species is responding to the native vegetation type, the years that have elapsed since the last fire, and whether that fire was high or low severity. And um, everything that I show you today will be particularly concerned with low fire severity. Now, within FAME, the default option is that um, there are these categorical predictions that were made by experts back in 2009. They're pretty coarse, um, but they cover this huge library of 323 species and 10 vegetation types. Um, now, some Victorian regions have developed really great bespoke response models that um, build, build on that kind of approach, but um, use um, real on-ground data as well, rather than just these expert predictions. Now, what we want to work towards is statewide consistency in the way that we're going about this and making better use of survey data where they're available, um, balanced with the guidance of experts in the cases where data are scarce. I think fire management is a really important space for risk management. And so I think it's really important that we express uncertainty and variation rather than just pinpoint predictions of what we think is going to go on. And if we can bring this all together, I think we're um, well equipped to build a plan that um, can allow for updating and improvement as time goes on. So let's take a, um, a particular example and start looking at this in more detail. Um, let's think about a common bronze wing in grassy, heathy, dry forest. Now, the default re um, relationship that sits within the FAME tool looks like this. We've got um, years since fire going along the horizontal um, axis there, and we've got the relative abundance of common bronze wing as a measure between zero and one. Now, those experts um, as a group back in 2009 developed this consensus model where they think that um, Common bronze wing are at medium relative abundance in those early years after a fire, and then things um, improve to their maximum potential relative abundance beyond about 40 years since fire. And you can see that there's um, just point values here, no expression of uncertainty or variation. And there's this real um, sort of quite sudden step jump from at that 40 year mark because of the um, categorical way in which they were making their estimates. Now we can get into the Victorian Biodiversity Atlas and pick up a bunch of BirdLife Australia data and um, take notice of when it is that people find common bronze wings in grassy, heathy, dry forest. And here's the information that I was able to pick up in April last year with um, NEV's help in assigning the um, vegetation type to each place and the fire history to each place as well. 
So again, we have years since fire along the horizontal axis from zero to 120 years. But we've got this different count now. We've got um, a survey count of how many common bronze wing were um, observed in each survey rather than this relative abundance from zero to one. So we've got different measurement scales going on. A couple of other things I notice are that um, we don't have any, any information beyond about 85 years since fire. And also there are lots and lots of zeros here. There are plenty of surveys in which common bronze wing are not observed at all. And we could interpret that in a few different ways. Um, firstly, maybe the survey location is just completely unsuitable for um, this species at any time. Um, secondly, maybe it's sometimes suitable, but we're in the wrong year, um, number of years since fire. It's not suitable at the moment. And that's what we're really interested in this model building process. And then the third option is just that um, natural variation from one survey to, to the next. This was a completely appropriate place for common bronze, bronze wing to turn up and um, they just weren't there and observable um, at the time of that specific survey. So what do we do with this kind of information where we've got these different um, formats, um, different potential interpretations of what we're seeing there? I think a great way of going about this is a Bayesian hierarchical model. And this is the approach that I'm proposing for how we can start analysing some of these data in the future. It's a two in one process where we can bring the expert data and the survey data together and build one common model for what we think is happening with relative abundance. So in the yellow boxes um, across the next few slides, I'll have the technical information about what that kind of model is. But we, um, if you're not a data nerd like me, you don't need to focus on those bits. Um, I'll walk you through the coloured um, central section and the general structure of what it is that I'm working through. In each model, we've got this context. We are focused on a particular species, a particular vegetation type at the location. Um, we need a measure of how many years have elapsed since fire at that location. And what we're really working towards here is this relative abundance measured between zero and one so that we can build something consistent and get it into that FAME tool. Down the left-hand side here, we have the way in which expert elicited data can contribute to that model. And that's something that we saw an example of before already. I've um, added an extra little component to this called a beta link so that we can get a measure of uncertainty into that process as well, so that it's not just perfect um, pinpoint predictions of what's going on, but we allow for some uncertainty and variation as well. And so at the moment in this process, it's that 2009 library of information that we're using to contribute through that um, left-hand side there into our relative abundance measure. On the right-hand side here, I've got a process for that survey data that I was thinking about before. And I'm doing some filtering on that data um, and some inference to in, um, take into account those different processes that I was worried about before, particularly around how it is that we interpret a zero when we don't find our species during our survey. Something fantastic what we've got available to us at ARI is this huge library of species distribution models that um, give us a sense of the long-term likelihood of um, a species being at that location. And so um, I'm using that as prior information to help us um, understand, is that, is that the process that these zeros could be coming from? Is there any hope that this place is ever suitable for the species at hand? Um, I go through a um, process of random number generation for a particular survey. And then if um, we decide that this place is potentially um, suitable in the long term for the species, we can move into this left hand side here where we think about, well, if it is suitable, what kind of counts do we actually expect to see um, during a particular survey? And this is a really important link between what we're ultimately aiming for, this measure on zero one, and the um, observation process that we're using in this specific survey method. So. Um, for these BirdLife Australia data, it's the number of individuals counted during a two hectare, 20 minute survey. Um, so we need a conversion factor, which I'm calling a calibration multiplier to flip between this relative abundance on zero one and this meaningful count scale that our survey um, on ground surveys are generating in their process. Oh, sorry, um, maybe I'll just go back a slide. And um, just emphasise again that those things come together, um, the occupancy as one part, and then secondly, the survey, um, the average expected survey count come together 
to um, to generate our observed survey count for this particular um, time and location in the survey data. So let's go back to our common bronze wing in grassy heathy dry forest. Um, before you may remember that I had um, what looked like kind of long lines of red dots here for the expert data. If I had used all of those points that I had showed you before, what I would have been saying is that I think the expert information is equivalent to 121 on ground surveys. I think that's a bit of an overstep. And so what I've done is I've um, reduced the weighting of that expert data into the, in the analysis down to being worth 24 data points. And so you can see that I've tried to evenly spread those data points across the different vegetation growth stages in grassy, heathy, dry forest. In the right graph here again, I've got the um, survey data that we have that we've drawn from the Victorian Biodiversity Atlas and how we think um, that might play into the situation. Now I'm going to show you a model and it's going to be two blue lines, but the two blue lines are actually one unified model. And these um, this unified model is taking into account both the expert elicited information and the survey data simultaneously. Um, the blue line itself is the mean response, our best guess at what we think is happening here. The blue shaded area indicates our model uncertainty. So that's we're 95% sure that the response should sit within that shaded area. And then when we look at the green area, that um, takes into account variation in data observations themselves as well. And so we expect that 95% of those red data points should be sitting within that green shaded area. And it's a pretty good match in this case. So the two blue lines are actually this one unified model, but they're expressed on these two different measurement scales. We've got relative abundance from zero to one on the left-hand scale and a survey count from um, zero up to four and beyond on the right-hand side. Um, we can see that as we make that conversion from one scale to the other, it looks like the line really flattens out in the survey scale. There's still a subtle increase going on there, but it's just happening from what looks like, what, 0.2 to maybe 0.25 or 0.3 average um, individuals observed per survey. We can see that it's a really great um, fit through the expert information. It looks like a really natural, smooth interpretation of what the experts were saying. And it also enables us, because we didn't have survey data from 80 to 120 years since fire, it enables us to make an interpretation in that space too, because the experts were saying over that range that they think um, the relative abundance is high and consistent across that range. So we can extrapolate to that area in the survey count space because it would have this one unified model for the two um, different measure, measurement scales. Let's look at another case. Here's a black-faced cuckoo shrike in Forby Forest. Now this is a case where um, we've got this expert information that predicted relatively um, low abundances in um, very soon after the fire. Um, escalating up to maximum relative abundance from say 30 or 40 years since fire onwards. But the unified model isn't showing that at all. It's showing a relatively consistent, constant best guess at relative abundance across all years since fire. That's because we're in a situation here where the survey data has um, overwhelmed the expert information, that there's um, more information and more signal coming from the survey data and it's showing very little evidence of a change in the survey count across those years since fire. That said, the blue shading there is really wide at high years since fire. And so that's probably an acknowledgement, an indication that um, there is this discrepancy between what the experts predicted and what the survey data are showing. And some allowance that although our best guess is no change, there's some possibility of um, increased observations of black-faced cuckoo shrike when we're many years um, after a fire, 80 or more. One more example for you. Let's look at crimson rosella in moist forest. Um, this is a case where we did not have information from those 2009 expert elicitation um, exercises, 
So the model is built entirely on survey data that we've drawn from the Victorian Biodiversity Atlas. And it shows um, an expected increase in the observed survey count as we go from zero up to 80 years since fire. But because we've got this as a unified model and we can convert between these two scales, we can back transform that um, estimated model there that's based on the survey data into that measurement space um, where we have relative abundance between zero and one. And we can um, capture that increase and have a model that's completely suitable as an input for future fame analyses. So in summary, um, in the past year or so, we've been able to develop 55 new models of this kind. They cover 13 different species and six vegetation types. And I think the really important features of this modeling approach are that it integrates two really different data formats into a unified response model. The generalized additive model approach that I've used allows for flexible faunal response shapes. So it's not just straight lines up and down. We can accommodate, accommodate some curves in what's going on, even some um, peaks and troughs if that's what's needed. And I think it's got some really neat nuanced interpretation of survey data particularly that issue of when we don't see a species during a survey and we get a survey count of zero, how do we interpret that? Is that an issue of long-term occupancy, an issue of um, the current fire profile at, at that point, or is it just random variation amongst our surveys? That said, there's still some judgment needed in the way that we go about this analysis. So how we weigh the expert data against the survey data is still a judgment we, we need to make in advance. And also that calibration multiplier, the way in which we jump between those two measurement scales is um, something where we need to make an initial estimate for what that conversion factor should be. Although the data themselves can tell us in a lot of cases, lead us to what an appropriate value is once the analysis commences. What could be next for this kind of modeling? Well, I think we could be doing um, precisely the same thing across many more species and more vegetation types. Um, as you would have seen in my early slides, the default information covers several hundred species, so there's still lots more to do in this space. Um, we could be ex improving and expanding the data collation that we use um, with this technique and incorporate other survey methods, not just the BirdLife Australia survey counts, but extending to other um, fauna and techniques like camera trapping and so on. I would like to unify this model across species and vegetation types. Instead of treating each case study as a separate independent analysis, I think there's um, ways in which we could trade information uh, by um, unifying the analyses themselves into a, a larger global analysis. And I think there's many sources of variation that we could be taking into account, thinking more about in the way that we build these models, um, taking into account the effects of observer and the location, the season and the time of day at which surveys happen. There are lots of habitat variables that could be playing into this. And one of my favourites is always thinking about imperfect detection as well. And what's in the works for FAME more broadly? Well, I think um, here we've developed a FAME friendly approach that expands and combines data sources beyond that default 2009 expert data. I think it's really important that it expresses uncertainty and variation. And it's something that's really well set up for um, being updated with new data as we go. Yes. Um, can we be mixing these um, this small set of models that we've got at the moment with other ones in, in a FAME analysis? Well, we're working on something at the moment um, that's a report and a checklist for how we evaluate data and models that could be used in FAME. And so I'm really looking forward to getting into more detail there about um, whether these models can be used live right now as they are, or whether we need to be building that bigger set or being careful about how we mix different models together into one analysis. And can we elicit better data from the experts compared to um, that approach that we took in 2009? Um, we think we th that we can. And Nev and our colleague Erica, who has um, been joining us from QUT this semester, have been working together on a web-based app and protocol for eliciting not just best guesses, but also uncertainty around um, people's understanding of um, faunal responses in this space. They're initially targeting species and vegetation types that were identified as data gaps in a report that was um, led by my colleagues, Matt and Nev. 
And we've also had an um, intern from RMIT with us this semester named Gay, and she's exploring new statistical techniques for analysing this new format of data where we've got uncertainty as well as just best guesses. So um, together, I think we're um, working on some really exciting new techniques that hopefully can support and advance the way that DECA staff um, embark on their fire management planning to conserve biodiversity in Victoria. Thanks very much. Thank you, Cindy. Wow, I love it. Um, and I know you talked with us about bronze wings and rosellas and cuckoo shrikes, but I'm thinking of a swan. Like this reminds me of a swan. Like it's this beautifully elegant thing on the surface that's progressing along and so useful and helping us with all these beautiful, elegant things. And under the surface, there's all this stuff going on that's contributing <laughs> to this. Like the nuance and integration in this is incredible. That's uh, Congratulations. It's really exciting work and um, just has this beautiful elegance above the surface and all that complexity underneath. Very thoughtful, rich, integrated work. Thank you. That is brilliant. Um, questions, Tess? We've got yep. a couple of minutes. Who can we who can we help with some questions? Yeah, Peter so, and Erica. Yeah, Peter's got a question. Interested in how you are able to account for inaccuracies of archive fire history mapping and patchiness for the analysis. Um, also, if control sites were used or considered in the analysis for the occupancy model. Thank you, Peter. Um, there, yeah, we've in active discussions at the moment around the. Um, the issues of the fire history mapping and um, particularly, I, I think, as a broader DECA issue of like how do we identify the um, the points of truth and how we justify them because um, there can be automated methods by which some of these things have been estimated and then, um, for example, on, to, on ground, um, ground truthing of those observations as well and how do we justify and well document um, a set that we can continue to rely on in the future rather than having to relitigate these things um, over again every time we do a study. Um, so I, I would say I, I can't make a huge guarantee for what I've done right now, but it's um, something that we we definitely have our sights on. Um, control sites for occupancy modelling. Um, I'd say the so these are models that are built as um, presence background models. So the um, control data are artificially generated absence points in the way that those models are built, um, which is always not ideal. But uh, again, a, a process with um, active advancement at ARI, my colleagues um, such as Ken Ran Lu and Jim Thompson have, are working actively in that space at the moment too. Awesome. Thanks, Cindy. Um, Got a couple of minutes, so I might quickly go to Erica's question. So it seems that zeros really interfere with the estimates. Would that be a um, would that be a way to account for them? Would there be a way to account, account for them and explore further the reason behind so many zeros? Mm, yeah, I think the zeros are um, really interesting and something that are always going to be present in this kind of data. And so um, what we do is we, we're not able to pinpoint to any specific zero, oh, this is definitely about unsuitability or this is definitely about a detection failure and so on. But we can um, probabilistically assign, um, yeah, we can assign probabilities to the relative likelihood of which phenomenon is observing in each case. Um, and I think some of those expansions that I was suggesting around um, imperfect detection and some of the other things could help us refine that process too. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Um, there's a lot more questions, but we're, we're at time now. So um, we might, um, would, it, would it be okay for people to get in contact with you, Cindy, to, to get the, or you happy to chat to people about some of these questions? Um, Absolutely. Really happy to chat offline with people. Yeah. There is a good question here is how can I learn more about the models? Um, that's a good way to finish up, I guess. 
music to my ears that anyone would want to read more about my Bayesian hierarchical model, um, that we do have a written report that is um, endorsed and completed now at ARI about that. I guess it's the property of the forest and fire ecosystem science unit. And so um, together with them, I'm sure that's something that we can um, share with people. Awesome. Might hand it back to you, Fan. Terrific. Thanks, Tess, and thanks, Cindy, and let's explore whether that project could be shared more widely. Um, I'd just like to say thank you so much to our, our presenters today, both Joss and Cindy. I uh, just love the innovation and progress that this work is depicting. It's quite exciting and so necessary in uh, the work that we are aiming to do in supporting biodiversity across the state and beyond. So thank you, Joz and Cindy. They were fabulous presentations. Thanks so much to Tess for doing all the tech and wrangling this and making sure that it works and runs smoothly and doing the questions. Thanks, Tess. Thanks to everybody who did type in questions and thanks to everybody who's here today. And oh, Simon, yes, what a perfect quick result. That's great. <laughs> fabulous. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>